I've always known when the grass is greener on my side. I know that when people come home and they see my bookshelves, they're always so happy and and they say that Sonali, you're so lucky. You have such a huge collection of books, and they come from various generations of your family, and they're all with you. And you know, you're so fortunate. Or when I fall ill, for example, I know I can access a doctor. I know I can access medicines, no matter how small or minor the illness may be. There are times when I'm working very late, or like today, I have a very busy schedule. And I come home, and my husband would have done the laundry, would have made his own food, he would have made my food, and I know that I am fortunate. I know my privilege when it comes to certain things, and yet sometimes people surprise me. So about a month or two ago, a friend was staying with me, and um, we woke up the next morning, and she looked at me and she said, "You slept," and I said, "Well." Yeah, I mean, it was night. That's what people do. We sleep at night, don't we? And she said, "You know, I envy that you slept all night long." This is Sonali Acharji, and you are listening to Health Wealth, a podcast that wants to give you a very simple and honest understanding of all aspects of health and well-being, so you don't get overwhelmed by lists and do's and don'ts but you feel you you leave this show feeling motivated to do something about looking after yourself i never thought sleep was a privilege i really genuinely thought it's something that just comes naturally to people but then i started reading up and i came across a survey which just came out last week in fact it's by a company called wakefit and it took into account about 10000 responses from indians across various cities and age groups and it found about one in four people actually fear that they have insomnia and that the number of people who are staying up beyond 11 pm every night is just increasing it's gone up by about 3% in a year's time and it just gave me it it made me pause and i was just wondering what is it you know why is it that i can just shut my eyes and fall asleep why is it that my bedtime for as long as i can remember has been fixed i just go to sleep at 9 pm i don't know what happens to me um by the time it's 7 pm my brain starts slowing down by 9 o'clock i'm asleep and i wake up at 5 am and that that's been my routine it's a fixed natural permanent part of my life as much as breathing oxygen every day and yet i look around and i see the people who can't imagine sleeping at 9 o'clock at night and i don't want to get all sleep moralisty on anyone here because i believe one should sleep when they at least that's what i think is healthy that one should be able to sleep when they naturally feel sleepy but it did make me wonder because all my life i've been told go to sleep early wake up early that's the healthiest thing that's the right thing and that's when i thought for a second that does my childhood have a role to play in this because i know that my mother was very strict about me going to sleep at a certain time um there would be popeye on cartoon network which i would watch around 6 o'clock and then we'd have dinner and then i'd read a book and i'd naturally fall asleep so even today if you know i'm a little stressed out or overthinking or you know i've decided to watch some television serial and all i can think about is who murdered whom and i can't sleep i open a book and sleep just comes very very naturally to me so i i thought maybe that somewhere where the habits get created and i really wanted to know more about this so i have with me today someone who can hopefully shine a lot of new facts and you know give us some insights on what we can do and whether we even need to do something um to set into motion healthy sleeping patterns from an early age for those of us who have children or those of us who have nieces and nephews how much of an impact does childhood sleep play in who we are and 
um, how we sleep as adults. Because I also think that sleep plays a role in who we are because people who don't sleep get very cranky. So I have with me today Himani Dalmia. She is a pediatric sleep expert. She is the co-author of Sleeping Like a Baby. And I've also come across a lot of her blog posts and videos, and she has a lot to say about sleep. So thank you so much for coming today. Uh, no, thank you, Sonali. Uh, you know, sleep is one of my favorite topics, and uh, I love talking about it. <laughs> Because actually, it is so fascinating. Yeah. And there is so much more to it than meets the eye. You're right. You know, we all take sleep for granted. We feel that we'll just sleep. You know, when we're tired, we'll sleep. And if we <laughs> don't sleep, maybe that means we yeah. don't need to sleep. Yeah. Um, but that's not all there is to it. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, I think that in the last couple of decades, the research on sleep has increased a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that people are starting to take seriously now, whether it's the medical community or just, you know, uh, general people who are aware and, you know, who, 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 who care about their health and well-being have started to pay attention to sleep. So I would say that something that happened with, say, nutrition let's say, 30 yeah. years ago, but has been increasing. Yeah. You know, before that, it was just, you know, eat a balanced diet, eat healthy, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, but then we started to deconstruct it, understand it better, you know, um, and people started to focus on nutrition. I think that's happening with sleep now. It's sleep's turn now. Isn't yes, it? it's sleep's turn. So I wanted to start with something which is very basic, and it yeah. sounds like a very simplistic thing to ask someone. But I think that, terms that we're so used to, um, we often take for granted. We might not really know the full extent of it. Yeah. So what is sleep? So sleep is, um, it is a state of rest and repair. It's when our, um, our, our brain slows down, our body slows down. Um, it is not, however, only a state of rest and repair. So our body, our brain, our cells do rejuvenate when we're sleeping, but there's a lot going on. So our brains are actually, well, that repair part is mm -hmm. quite active. Mm -hmm. So even the body is working quite hard mm -hmm. while we're sleeping. Mm -hmm. uh, and so is the brain, you know, so the brain is sorting memories, forming connections, pruning, you know, converting short term memory into long term memory, processing emotions. Um, so the brain is actually working really hard. Um, so, you know, while we may look asleep and immobile, there's actually a lot going on in there, um, which is what actually makes sleep so important. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sometimes when people can't fall asleep, um, the natural thing to do today is go online. And we go through all these terms and jargons, um, none of which I think are properly explained. So maybe if you could help with a few of them. Um, what is melatonin? Because this comes up very often when you you know try to find out more about sleep. So what is it? Melatonin is the sleep hormone. So mm -hmm. it's the hormone um, that is produced mm -hmm. um, by the pineal gland um, to induce sleep. And it's affected by light. So if there is any light, so the signal goes through the retina to the brain. Um, if there's any light, the production of melatonin is slowed down or stopped. So um, it's also linked to our body's circadian rhythm and day-night clock mm -hmm. because um, the, the circadian rhythm is impacted, therefore, by light. So that's how we know night from night and, yeah. you know, night and day from each other. And how, that's also how we adjust to, say, mm -hmm. jet lag, mm -hmm. right? And so the more light exposure we have, um, the more well-tuned our body will be and right. the, the, the day-night clock will be. Um, similarly, if we use a lot of screens, if we watch TV, if we're on our phones, mm -hmm. blue light is the worst for melatonin. Mm -hmm. So it will obstruct the production of melatonin, which is why the recommendation is, you know, switch off your devices for 
like an hour, I would say. I mean, yeah. they say half an hour, but and you know, podcasts work great for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you can read an actual book, yeah. uh, but some people actually find it really relaxing to listen to a podcast mm-hmm. or listen to an audio book mm-hmm. um, instead of um, you know watching something or looking yeah. at looking yeah. at a screen because blue light obstructs melatonin. So does white light. So does yellow light. The least obstructive is red light. Yeah. Um, it's still obstructive, but the least obstructive. And so red melatonin light is would the be? red light is just a red colored oh, light. Red colored yeah. Light. So okay. um, yeah. So so melatonin is basically it's the sleep hormone yeah. that the body produces. The funny thing is when uh, people say don't do screen time, I always thought it's the content of what's on the screen and not yeah. the screen itself that keeps me up. It's a bit of both, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I knew it had something to do with you know what yeah. I'm viewing as well. Yeah. Uh, you said. Another word here, which is um, the next thing that I was going to ask you. What is circadian rhythm? So circadian rhythm is the body's day and night clock. Um, So all of our body functions are, you know, whether it is releasing certain hormones at a certain time or just the digestive system working, um, the circulatory system working, like all of our organs are on a timer. Mm -hmm. And that is the body's circadian rhythm. So in fact... Um, day and night is just one aspect, like sleep and not sleeping is just one aspect. Mm-hmm. But actually, our whole body works mm-hmm. according to a circadian rhythm. Um, it has a it has a very sophisticated body clock. There's a lot of research being done on the circadian rhythm now, which is super fascinating. Like, you know, uh, if a certain medication is given to the body at a certain time, mm-hmm. including, you know, for serious diseases like cancer and Mm -hmm. will it actually increase the efficacy of that medication Um, because the body is ready for it in a different way the body Mm -hmm. is going to process it in a different way Mm -hmm. so the circadian rhythm is just the it's the day and night clock or the body clock and with all of this um, you know what I'm hearing is that day and night plays a big role in how well we sleep um, the patterns of sleep we have so in that sense is early to bed and early to rise. Is that really a true um, healthy way to be? This is a great uh, question. Um, the thing is, the jury is out on this. Mm-hmm. There are two different schools of thought. So there is one school of thought that says, you know, early to bed and early to rise is the way. It's the mm-hmm. only way. Um, and it's so linked to the way we slept, you know, in pre-industrial times because, you know, there was no electricity. So, Mm -hmm. of course, you know, 7 p.m. activities slowed down and people would be asleep between 7 and 8 p.m. Interestingly, um, the research now shows that um, a few hundred years ago, and actually, therefore, for thousands of years before that, human beings didn't actually sleep through the night. They had two chunks of sleep. So they would go to sleep from, say, 7 p.m. to 11 Mm p.m. They would then actually have two to three hours awake at night. uh, And then they would go back to sleep after that. So it's the concept of two sleeps. So there was the first sleep of the night and the second sleep of the night. Um, Now... Ever since, you know, uh, the, the the Industrial Revolution and the fact that, uh, uh, oh, and also everyone took a nap during yeah. the day. Yeah. So there were yeah. actually three chunks of sleep. Mm-hmm. Dur- so there were the two sleeps at night and there was sleep mm-hmm. during the day. Now, this changed when uh, the Industrial Revolution happened and people actually needed a workforce mm-hmm. available through the day. Mm-hmm. Um you know, in factories and and places like that. So, and this coincided with electricity. Mm -hmm. Um, And so things changed very rapidly and it became more about, you know, no naps, except in a few countries which still, you know, have siestas. But overall, no naps um, and just one chunk of sleep at night, right? Let's say from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. or Mm -hmm. 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. or or something, Mm -hmm. something like that. Now here, so there is the school of thought that says, no, your body's circadian rhythm is sunset to sunrise. So you mm-hmm. should be sleeping early. You should be waking up early. Mm-hmm. Of course, adults don't sleep like 11 hours, right? So sunset to sunrise would be like 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Like yeah. that, That's a bit hard. Then you yeah. would have to do it in that split night way of being up for two, three hours in the middle of the night. Um, but 
there is also the theory that some people are night owls uh, and some are morning larks. Mm-hmm. So there are some people who naturally sleep early um, and and that's just how their body clock is and they wake up early. And there are some people who just cannot sleep. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not a moral failing on their yeah, part. Yeah. They actually, their body clock is such that mm-hmm. they just cannot sleep mm-hmm. uh, until midnight um, or even after. And they are not functional before 9 a.m. Uh, or 10 a.m. Yeah. And the joke is that these two people usually marry each other. Yeah. I, I, it, it's actually like that in my house. Genuinely yeah. like that. I go to sleep yeah. at 9 p.m. and I'm up by 5. Yeah. My husband goes to sleep at 3 a.m. Yeah. So it, I, I think it's it's um, the foundation of a lovely marriage. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's yeah. always someone energized and ready to do something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell me, what school of thought do you subscribe to? You've had so much of experience. What would you... So for adults, I do think that it is the morning lark and Mm -hmm. night owl um, Mm -hmm. thing. Um, That is kind of what it is in in my home as well. Uh, I do think that, uh, I mean, that that there are people who have earlier bedtimes. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of it is a function of the fact that in the last 200 years, we have actually not been sleeping as per our biological programming, which was this split night kind Mm -hmm. of sleep Mm -hmm. and a daytime nap. So I think that since that is now not happening, Mm -hmm. this is the way that our bodies have adapted and coped, that some people are taking that chunk in the first half of the night and some people are taking it more Mm -hmm. in the second half. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do think that um, a lot of it is not just our biology, but Mm -hmm. also a function of how modern life is. Um, But whatever it may be, Mm -hmm. the the way things stand now, uh, I think it is morning lark and night owl. I think everyone does have their own body clock. Uh, The only exception I would say is children. Mm -hmm. Because I think that children do need an mm-hmm. early bedtime. Mm-hmm. Children need a lot of sleep. And I think that is, um, so again, th- there can be a small range. Mm-hmm. It's not like 7 p.m. is some kind of alarm where mm-hmm. every child needs to be asleep. Mm-hmm. Babies do thrive with okay. an early bedtime. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, because children do need a lot of sleep, like up till the age of five years, mm-hmm. Children need 11 to 12 hours of night sleep. So if they go to sleep at 8 p.m., they would Mm -hmm. be waking up at 7 a.m. And what happens if they don't get that much sleep? Uh, A lot Apart from crying and tantrums. Uh, um, No, so look, what goes on with a baby or a child when they're sleeping? Mm -hmm. A lot goes on. So the growth hormone is secreted during sleep. Um, In fact, in the hours before midnight, again, linked to the circadian clock. So we actually want to maximize the sleep in the hours before midnight. Immunity also develops Mm -hmm. during sleep. So, you know, usually we're thinking, what do I feed my child to get Mm -hmm. them to Mm -hmm. uh, be, you know, uh, to have stronger Stronger. immunity? Uh, But very often, it's not just about the food, it's also about the sleep. So cytokines, which are the proteins that are the building blocks of immunity, are produced during sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, So the brain grows during sleep. Short-term memory converts into long-term memory. Our ability to learn is impacted by how much sleep we get. Neural connections are formed during sleep. It also affects obesity, like childhood obesity. So if we don't get enough sleep, we're actually uh, more prone to Mm -hmm. issues like obesity and heart health Mm -hmm. as well. It can impact heart health. Mm -hmm. Um, So if a child is not getting enough sleep, All of this is impacted, right? The child will fall sick more. The child will not be able to focus um, on tasks, will not learn as well, will, of course, be fussy and cranky because emotional regulation will be impacted Mm -hmm. as well. So both mental and physical health Mm -hmm. and growth um, is impacted yeah. if the child is not yeah. getting enough sleep. I, I hope someone listening to this doesn't go back and say, Mom, I didn't do well in math because you didn't let me sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's very interesting that uh, you chose to be a child or particularly an infant sleep expert. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey with sleep and why do you do what you do? Right. So... Um, You know, babies don't sleep like adults. Uh, Babies, I mean, anyone who has a baby or has ever had a baby or has had, you know, 
a niece been around, around babies, you, been around yeah. babies, yeah. will know that definitely the first two years, but I would say all the way up till the first five years, mm-hmm. um, their sleep systems are quite immature. They're un- they're, they take a long time to develop. So they don't sleep just the way older children do or the way adults do, which leads to a lot of chaos in the household. Uh, parents are very sleep deprived um, in the initial years. And, you know, babies are... They're waking up several times at night. They're Mm -hmm. fussy and cranky. They're resisting sleep. They're resisting naps. They're resisting bedtime. Uh, They wake up when you put them down Mm -hmm. when they're sleeping. And, you know, there's a lot of chaos that happens. Mm -hmm. I encountered this uh, um, when I first became a mother, which Mm was uh, eight years ago. And I immediately started reading about it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there are a lot of books, a lot of medical research on sleep for babies. Um, And I found it really interesting, really fascinating. So I just read and read and read. Um, And I realized that everything that I was reading and then, you know, implementing in my own way at home uh, was working beautifully. So I actually just, um, so a a friend of mine, Neha Bhatt, um, who is also the co-author of my book, Mm she and I discovered we had this passion and uh, we founded a Facebook group called Gentle Baby Sleep India. Yeah. Um, at that point, it was just something we thought, you know, this is something we know about and let's just create a support group, you know, because it is a pain point for parents and we know something about it. So let's see if we can help. But the group just took off. You know, it now has 60,000 members. It's a super active group. Um, There's a lot of engagement and action on it every Mm -hmm. day. Parents invite other parents. So we have hundreds of new members every day um, because it's such a genuine pain point. So it's a completely non-commercial group. We Mm -hmm. give our time to it voluntarily. Uh, Neha and me and a whole group of admins who are like super passionate, um, well-read mothers, largely, um, who, you know, who, who, who help other parents mm-hmm. on sleep. So when the Facebook group took off, um, you know, over the years, my own reading and research increased, and I decided that I wanted to study this formally. Um, so I studied it with an institute uh, in Australia. Now, baby sleep, you know, world the world over it's it's a huge thing it's actually like a multi-billion dollar industry there are sleep trainers sleep clinics sleep books uh, because it is actually such a huge pain point and Mm -hmm. babies sleep in such a unique way Um, and when you become a parent you actually know nothing about it so you actually need someone to tell you whether it's a sleep consultant or sleep trainer or book or something right Um, but in India nobody I mean there weren't too many people who knew anything about baby sleep. So this was a need. Um, So Neha and I decided that we would encapsulate all of our learnings and experiences in a book and and hence Sleeping Like a Baby was born. I was already supporting lots of parents one-to-one, you know, just as an organic offshoot of the Facebook group. Um, And I realized that, that people wanted this kind of support. So I decided that, I mean, I can't continue in this organic manner anymore. I'll have to structure it a little bit. So now I do, you know, professional consults um, as well, which is how I ended up in this Mm -hmm. um, space. Uh, And this Facebook group still exists. It's still, you know, super active. Mm -hmm. Um, So like I said, baby sleep in general is Mm -hmm. a huge field the Mm -hmm. world over. It is a multi-billion dollar Mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. However, the main difference uh, between what I do, what the Facebook group does, what our book is all about Mm -hmm. is that we focus on biological norms and Mm -hmm. what is natural to the baby and what is good for the baby. Mm -hmm. The baby sleep industry worldwide actually focuses more on, um, let's say, the needs of the parents and how do we, you know, For example, the U.S. has no maternity or paternity leave, right? There's no federally mandated maternity or paternity leave. So parents actually need to return to work very quickly. So everything is kind of centered on um, how do we get this baby to stop being an inconvenience and, you know, get the parents out into the workforce as quickly as possible, 
which is very often not what is aligned to the biology of the baby. So we're very baby led, we're very baby centered. So our ethics on this are extremely strong mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the focus is still a non-commercial Facebook group where we're trying to get the right information out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that what the, the fact that it is an industry mm -hmm. uh, shows that there is a need, but there is also a need to kind of step back and look at this in a slightly different way, the way baby sleep works. Yes. No, the, yeah. the physical touch thing, I, yeah. I think what we sometimes forget is that we've got so much of modern conveniences and so much of technology. Um, our bodies are still very much prehistoric in a, in a sense. Absolutely. You know, our instincts are still what they were, you know, evolved to do. Um, now, I don't have human children, but I do have a couple of dogs who I raised from oh, me when they were yeah. extremely young. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of them, in fact, I got when he was about a month old. Um, I didn't know at that time and he'd been sort of abandoned. So I had him and he had to sleep with me. Yeah. yeah. He, he literally needed the warmth of the hand, even yeah. if it was just a finger on him. But he couldn't sleep unless yeah. that finger was on him. Yeah. And and that was, you know, when you said this, that actually just reminded me of it. That hang on, it's not, it's, I, I, I don't think it's just. Um, it's all mammals. It's, it's all mammals, right? Yeah. You need that warmth of touch um, yeah. to fall asleep. But you know what's ironic? Yeah. It's ironic that many parents mm -hmm. will actually have their dog sleeping in bed with them, <laughs> including me. Uh, <laughs> but... They will not have the baby sleeping in bed with them, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, regardless of whether the dog is in the bed, that's yeah. a separate discussion altogether. But uh, uh, there is like this double standard yeah. that, you know, uh, other mammals might because need Because you're this. reading so much online yeah. that says, no, no, you know, you should have them regimentalized from a young age, yeah. put in a crib, then they'll get clingy, then they won't leave your bed. Yeah. You know, so there's just such a huge information overload. Yeah. Um, and you're just trying to do the best that you can. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I've also met people who at some point accept that they're just overloaded with gyan hmm. and they're like, we're not going to listen to any of it. So I've had a friend who had a, another a, a boy and the boy is now about uh, five and she sleeps when he sleeps. Mm -hmm. So the adaptation is still continuing. So mm -hmm. if he decides he wants to be up all night, she'll be up all night. Mm -hmm. And if he wants to sleep in the day after school, she'll be sleeping then. She chooses mm -hmm. her sleep according to him. And her approach has been that it'll sort itself out. Mm -hmm. It sorted itself out for, you know, me, my mother, my grandmother, it'll happen. It's it's somehow some magic day will come and the boy will just go to sleep at nine and wake up at five. Right. Um, does that happen? I mean, is is does it just naturally work itself out? Or is the patterns that we develop in our childhood, are mm -hmm. those patterns the one that stay with us for life? It could really go either way. Okay. Um, so it could be that one day magically things fall into place, mm -hmm. right? But it could also be like, I do know of children who are, say, seven or eight years old who don't sleep very well, you know, um, who sleep very late at night. I think one of the main cultural issues that mm -hmm. we have in India mm -hmm. is late bedtimes. Yeah. Because we're in general a late culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we get off work late. The f Tell me about it. I face so much of trouble because I go yeah. to sleep early. Exactly. So I have to like, you know, on the days when there's a social event or something and yeah. I have to stay up. Yeah. I have to nap in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's, I just can't do it. So I'm actually at a disadvantage because, you know, my, my... Because the culture is so late, right? So you have babies or children even who are mm -hmm. falling asleep at, say, midnight mm -hmm. because they're sleeping when the parents sleep. Uh, and uh, either naturally waking up due to their circadian clock at 7 or 8 a.m. and therefore getting only 7 or 8 hours of sleep, which is honestly the adult level of sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, or they're being woken up for school at 7 a.m. and they're in a chronic uh, overtired Undersleep. cycle, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, and, and they have sleep deprivation. So sometimes it can also go that way. Um, there are also other things, you know, which... It, um, there can be physiological issues as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, if you've really tried everything, it may not be um, a bad idea to check for physiological issues. For example, you can have a child can have 
enlarged adenoids. A child can have a Sorry, tongue what, tie. What are adenoids? So just like tonsils, they're okay. in the throat, they're All further right. back. Uh, mm. But if they're, and they're fine, they're part of the body's natural uh, immune system. But some children have tons, have adenoids that mm-hmm. uh, flare up and then that blocks the airway. Okay. So that causes, causes a kind of like while you're sleeping, um, you'll be breathing through your mouth. Uh, you might wake up because you because your body has actually stopped breathing for a few seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. So you can have a tongue tie, mm-hmm. be, uh, which means that your tongue, the function of your tongue is affected. This impacts a lot of babies and children and even adults who haven't had it looked into when they were smaller. So again, that affects the airway. So if the tongue is not positioned correctly in the mouth while you're sleeping, um, that can cause a lot of sleep issues. Mm -hmm. So there are also physiological issues that that could be there. Mm -hmm. And then those don't go away. Right. So I know teenagers or even adults who do struggle with sleep because those issues were never looked into. Mm -hmm. Now, Um, coming to someone like your friend. Look, like I said, you drop a mother and a child on an island, they'll know what to do, right? So to an extent, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. You know, follow your intuition. Mm -hmm. Um, Your child will actually communicate everything. Babies are very good communicators. They will tell you exactly what they need as long as we have the eyes and ears to listen and understand. Um, So that in itself is not an issue. Uh, But... What I would say is that um, it's also not necessary because firstly, okay, maybe she has the flexibility to be able to nap during the day, Mm -hmm. to be able to be on her child's clock, right? A lot of parents don't have that, Mm -hmm. right? Like they, they, they have to go out to work during the day. And I mean, at no point am I saying that a stay at home parent um, you has know, it has it easy? Yeah. They don't. No. I mean, I've done both, uh, and for many years, it's not. It's and it's super exhausting. Mm-hmm. But you do have a little bit of flexibility. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you can get in that daytime nap. You can sleep when the child is sleeping, mm-hmm. right? Um, now, some parents may not have that, right? Um, what I would say is that yes, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but if you get the right information, this is not difficult to correct. It's very easy to correct. Like you just need to understand how overtiredness works, how a four or five year old actually needs to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we do. Right. And and what's like the highest age at which you can correct these sort of sleeping patterns? See, you and I can correct it even now. Is that the right way to say it? (laughs) I think so. Yeah, the oldest. The latest, latest, oldest. That's yeah. so hard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is the oldest age at which you can correct sleep issues? See, you can correct it at any, like you and I can correct it even now, right? right. Adults can also correct their yeah. sleep issues. There's no end date as such, right? Um, what I would say is that, look, before you hit something like school, where which is, again, not linked to the biology, more mm-hmm. linked to society and mm-hmm. the fact that there is school, mm-hmm. Um it's a good idea to look into it, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, it's interesting, but, but but there is now a huge movement to homeschool or unschool, which is a whole other discussion. But yeah. one of the reasons actually is because parents feel that the, they want to follow the baby's biological clock and they don't want to follow an arbitrary set of timings mm-hmm. uh, given to them by society. But anyway, if you are going to do that, um, then you may want to sort that out before school starts because otherwise it can become like it can spiral out of control the other thing is that teenagers Mm -hmm. there's a huge shift that happens in the way teenagers sleep there's a circadian shift Mm -hmm. so babies and toddlers do very well with early bedtimes um but teenagers there's a circadian shift where Mm -hmm. they actually fall asleep later at night and so it's not. So it wasn't the beer. It was the yeah. circadian shift. Yes. That's, that's what happened. And and and, it, and we weren't just lazy bums who yeah. wouldn't get up in the morning. See, yeah, it's all in the biology. Absolutely. <laughs> so they're actually falling asleep later yeah. and waking up later. Yeah. So there are some schools um, that have experimented with this, for example, and changed their morning start time from something like seven thirty a.m. or eight a.m. to nine a.m. or nine thirty a.m. Okay. Yeah. And they've actually seen very positive results because those teenagers are actually getting an hour of sleep that Mm -hmm. is extra, Mm -hmm. uh, which is helping them to function better and learn better through the day. Um, So 
that shift also occurs. So mm-hmm. I would say that, uh, um, you know, it's a good idea to sort things out before you reach that point, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because then you're dealing with a whole new shift mm-hmm. and a whole new set of circumstances. Yeah. So to sort it out, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, one can go to a pediatric sleep expert or join a support group. What about sleep medications? Are those advised for uh, certainly for children? They're not needed, to be honest. You know, unless there is some massive physiological Mm -hmm. issue, Mm -hmm. um, they're really not needed. I mean, in fact, it's quite um, upsetting that there are still doctors, you know, or other people who are prescribing almost just cough medication and antihistamines to induce sleep in children because there is such a lack of understanding of what is actually causing the sleep Mm -hmm. Uh, disturbances. Mm -hmm. So absolutely that should be avoided. But even something like melatonin, like Mm -hmm. giving melatonin tablets Mm -hmm. or, you know, that's not a long term solution. You need to figure out the root cause Mm -hmm. of what is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say, honestly, um, speak to someone, join a support group, Mm -hmm. read a book, Um, speak to someone who knows what they're talking about. Unfortunately, the medical community for children doesn't know a lot about this because this is, see, sleep, it is in some ways Mm -hmm. a medical issue, but it's a a medical issue, but it's also not. It's It's also also behavior and social issue and all of that. So, yeah, if you're dealing with adenoids or tongue ties or sleep Mm -hmm. disordered breathing or sleep apnea or or any of that, the medical community can advise you on that. Mm -hmm. But usually pediatricians or even sleep specialists, if if they're supposed to talk to you about behavior Mm -hmm. and the right routine and how to support your child to sleep and the right sleep environment and Mm -hmm. things like that, Honestly, what they're telling you is an educated guess. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's yeah. not based on any yeah. true training or knowledge. Yeah. You know, one more thing, which we just mentioned the word social and environment, we've been talking about it. Um, children respond so strongly to the world around them. You know, we did an episode recently on mental health in, chil- in children in conflict zones. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how um, being in an environment which is violent or stressful, that impacts not just the way that they see the world, but also they internalize it. So there's a lot of stress that doesn't let them go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, say in urban India, in a non-conflict zone, um, if there is internal conflict within the house, household conflict, Mm -hmm. um, or just a very, very tired set of parents, just Mm -hmm. exhausted parents, you know, Mm -hmm. not even parents who are arguing. Um, That also affects the baby. So self-care for any father or mother is as important as looking after their own child. In that sense, you've been through the drill. Mm -hmm. Are there some insights you could share on that and how they can sort of... um, just make their own health, look after themselves while they're also trying to, you know, um, figure out sleeping patterns for their child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, you're right. Um, And even something like, uh, you know, postpartum depression Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. postpartum anxiety can have a huge impact. Um, Which we talk so little about. And those who actually face it, I I, I think many of them don't even get a diagnosis done because you're just supposed to be happy after you've had a baby, right? Yeah, yeah. And and it can go on. Mm -hmm. It's not just the first three or four Mm -hmm. months. Uh, Postpartum depression can Mm -hmm. uh, go on for two years, three Mm -hmm. years. Um, And uh, so, you know, the thing is, there's an old African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And we've lost those villages. We don't have those villages anymore. Um, Very often, it's just a nuclear family. Um, Even if there is a set of grandparents, it's still not a village, you know, and our community is not designed for children. Um, So there can be a lot of stress in modern parenthood. There is also this sort of drive to get back to work, quote unquote, as quickly as possible, Mm -hmm. which is, again, not doing justice to either the child's biology or the parent's biology. Um, Now, for example, there is a lot of research that shows, particularly for the mother, that the mother's brain and the mother's biology also changes Mm -hmm. um, when she becomes a mother, right? 
and her instincts are mm-hmm. also telling her what to do they're telling her to hold the baby close to meet the needs of the baby so when we're actually creating that conflict in the mother by saying um and fathers can develop it too in a slightly different way but they do develop it but when we're creating this conflict for the mother saying hey you also have to go back to work or you have to um you know take care of the house or hey you shouldn't be so attached to your baby and you should even be able to go par- go out partying at night and all of that a lot of it creates a lot of stress right um some of it is so insidious that it's just social conditioning mm-hmm. like mothers won't even know that they're feeling this stress because it's a part of their conditioning they might actually feel they have a super supportive thing and this is mm-hmm. actually what they want to do and you know all of that but that biological conflict is happening inside mm-hmm. their bodies um so countries like scandinavia give like you know or even or hungary actually has a really amazing parental leave policy uh but there are progressive nations who are now giving 2 years of parental leave 3 years of parental leave because it's understood that the health of the future generations actually depends on that yeah. right yeah. um so i think that is something that um until society finds an answer each parent needs to find their own answer yeah. to that yeah. you know we have more choices than we think we do yeah. it's a matter of in our span of 80 years it's a matter of 2 years or 3 years where we need to figure out how to prioritize the baby yeah. right and yeah. sometimes that might involve being a little flexible about your life choices mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. some people may have the privilege the privilege to do it some people may not have the privilege to do it but like i said we usually have more choices than we think we do mm-hmm. so i think we need to take a step back and say i'm not superhuman i can't do it all right okay i can do it all but not at the same time yeah right and i need to be able to um and that's for both the mother and the father yeah. right yeah. i mean the father should also be completely involved and that's how the team works mm-hmm. um so you need your support structure you need to ask for help whether that's from friends whether that's from grandparents whether it's family or it's hiring help right um i mean this is the one time in your life that you pull out all the stops and you get the help you, you need make your own village exactly yeah. you make your yeah. own village yeah. so so you do need that yeah. and like you said like your friend has found the solution where she sleeps when the baby sleeps um if she's able to do that that's great you know so you have to find your solutions and you have to be very intentional about mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. so for example i would um i had the system where uh, you know my baby is always early to bed and early to rise um which is so not what i am as we just discussed so you know my babies yeah. would be up at like 6 or 6:30 yeah. yeah. i would hand them over to my husband yeah. and i would go back to sleep for 2 hours you know and he would handle them mm-hmm. um through the day i would make sure that i take one nap with them right now there are other parents who um who who let's say for example are more um you know morning lark people mm-hmm. and they prefer earlier bedtimes they actually go to bed with their baby at 8 pm you know and and that's how they handle themselves so you kind of need to be very intentional about your own self care and mm-hmm. your own health mm-hmm. um it doesn't help to go with the flow and then take out that resentment on the baby right the baby is just a baby so you have to meet the baby's needs and for that you need to be very intentional about your own yeah. health and and, and i think awareness plays a huge role um a knowing and recognizing that sleep is important yeah um and b finding solutions and i think something you said today has really stuck with me and that is physical touch because yeah. even today like if i'm very stressed and i can't sleep um even if a book doesn't do it on a rare rare occasion then i just need my mom's hand or my husband's hand on my head and that just calms me down and there is oxytocin yeah. um you know that that gets released when you are um you know holding on to someone you love or are feeling safe with Absolutely, so yeah. thank you so much for sharing that and this has just been wonderful and i i, I really hope it helps someone who's listening to it thank you Thank you Sonali. It's been a you. pleasure. As with everything else, I really think that one shouldn't beat themselves up if they don't get everything correct. Um something Himani said apart from physical touch that really um is also giving me food for thought is choose your heart. Choose the one that you can do because you literally cannot do everything 
um you would have a lot more things that perhaps need your energy and your effort than um just doing a little bit of everything and then just burning yourself out for me i i don't have children yet but i do have a lot of pets i do have a lot of animals and uh, i have actually really enjoyed um training them to sleep with me you know they go, now go to bed at the same time that i do um i it's not at all the same thing as a human child but um, it's it's been an enjoyable process it's also been a lot of teamwork and i've really needed a lot of help and support from my husband um but now we are a family of uh, seven animals and that that includes me and my husband <laughs> and we all sleep at well most of us sleep at the same time but there's a slight period between 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. when you know all of us are asleep and it it's it's really nice to be able to get good quality sleep how do you rest and has counting sheep ever really helped anyone fall asleep i'd really like to know more about your sleep experiences do write to us we are available at uh, pods@indiatoday.com or you can write to us at 8588966996 We are also available on Facebook, X, WhatsApp channels and Instagram.